I had a, a two-year relationship with uh, an undercover policeman who I knew as John Barker, and it was only many, many years later that I found out that actually his real name was John Dines. Um, in 1987, I got involved with London Greenpeace, which is um, independent of the big Greenpeace. Um, it was a, a broadly anti-capitalist environmental group. I met John there, and over the next three years, um, he became a close friend, and then we ended up uh, in a relationship. Um, he told me about his dad's death, and then he told me later on that his mum had died and he needed to borrow money to go to her funeral. Um, he told me that he was an only child, uh, he felt very alone in the world, that he'd lost his van and all his possessions. And all of these things were a very clever combination of both sob stories and excuses for why there was nobody around him and why he didn't have any kind of history that you could um, see. In reality, what I know now is that actually his mum was still alive and so was his dad and he had brothers and sisters. And his stories seeking my empathy and involvement in his life were actually a deliberate process of in emotional manipulation uh, in order to draw me closer to him um, so, so that he could spy on me and the other people that I knew in, in London Greenpeace and other, other groups and so that he could be part of undermining the political movements that we were involved with. But I didn't know any of that at the time. Um, I felt like I'd met my soulmate. You know, we just seemed to <coughs> enjoy all the same things, share all the same interests, um, you know, and get, get on great. Um, and after a while, we rented a flat together um, and, and lived together, and uh, we talked about starting a family. He said that he wanted lots of kids, well, that he was an only child, and um, I mean, basically, just all the kind of things that you would talk about in any normal relationship. Then in the last six months of our relationship, his beca behaviour became very erratic and he would kind of take off, disappear for the, the night saying he'd, he was going walking to kind of sort his head out um, and, and then he would come back and declare how much he loved me um, and all of this was extremely <coughs> emotionally draining, um, you know, one minute thinking he was disappearing, the next minute he was back and then finally he disappeared for good. Um, I... I the last I heard, heard from him was two letters that were posted from South Africa saying that he was sorry but he couldn't cope with things anymore, he was going to try and sort his head out and the last one said that if he did manage to sort his head out then he'd come back. Now, I was actually extremely worried about his mental well-being um, and I was even worried that he might kill himself because he just seemed in really quite a distressed state for, for quite a while. Um, and I was also still deeply in love with him, so I spent a long time trying to find out what had happened to him, trying to trace him. Um, but basically everything that I investigated turned up more questions than answers. You know, I, I, I looked for his parents' um, death certificates in the hope that I might find out their addresses and then be able to find him through that. And actually there was no trace of his parents' death certificates, and it was just like the, everything that I looked at just led to more questions. Um, but also, it, over, over a while, you know, I gradually got more and more concerned about who he might have been and what he was actually doing and why it was that I couldn't find out anything about him. And, and then uh, the McLeibel trial, which, um, which was mentioned, uh, kind of got in the way a bit and I, I, I had to um, get engaged with that, which was pretty much full time from early 1993 until the trial itself started in June 94. Um, and so I was very much focused on that. And one day, um, but one day coming home from court, uh, I, I, I used to walk past the um, register of birth, deaths and marriages at the time it was in Holborn, near the Royal Courts of Justice. And just something one day made me go in there and start looking through the death records. And what I found at that point was that um, John had actually been using the identity of a child who died aged eight years old. And that, uh, well, basically it completely <coughs> threw my life into turmoil. Um, you know, here was this person who I was deeply in love with, who I'd lived with, who I thought I knew lots about, and actually, I didn't know anything about him. I didn't even know his name. Um, and it, you know, the whole thing threw 
all my other relationships into doubt. It, it, it was like, well, if someone who I've lived with for two years is, is you know, is actually, doesn't exist, what, what's this for anybody around me? How can I know that anybody around me is real? And it really, really messes with your head. Um, and the other thing that happened was that I became very fearful of talking to anybody about it because I started thinking, well, maybe, maybe it was an undercover policeman. The other thing I thought was maybe it was a, a corporate spy because during the McLeibel trial, what had become apparent was that there were, um, well, they'd actually disclosed the notes eventually from seven private investigators that had infiltrated London Greenpeace. So, you know, I knew from that that <coughs> there were private investigators <coughs> infiltrating political movements. And basically what I felt was that if I talked to anybody about this, it would lessen my chances of finding out the truth because they would try and cover up what was going on. So I, I very much kept it to myself, apart from talking to a couple of very, very close friends who, you know, they kind of said, well, it's a bit unlikely that, um, you know, I suppose it's possible, it's a bit unlikely. And, well, as I say, I was engaged in fighting the McLeibel case, so for, for a while I kind of um, didn't really pursue it any, any further. I'd kind of gone as far as I could, could with the, the things that I had to go on. Um, and then, um, essentially, well, I, I did more investigations and eventually I found out his real name and I found out, I found his marriage certificate um, and at that point his marriage certificate said um, policeman, that he'd been a policeman. But even then, when I talked to my dad and close friends about it, um, the, the marriage certificate was something like uh, 11 or 12 years before I'd had a relationship with him and, and people just sort of said, yeah, but it's more likely that, you know, he was embarrassed about his background and didn't want to declare that he was a policeman when he got involved with his political group. So, you know, it's, it's, that sort of thing doesn't happen in this country. We don't have, like, undercover policemen, you know, spending years in political movements. That's the sort of thing you hear about in, you know, East Germany and China and, and Russia or wherever. That doesn't happen in de democratic countries. And so, you know, I, I, I kind of, I was still extremely, well, I was wanting to know the truth. I was wanting to find him, to find out what had happened. But as I say, I'd kind of hit this brick wall. And then um, around the time that uh, Mark Kennedy was exposed as, a, um, as, a, as, a, as an undercover policeman, I went to visit um, a woman who'd actually ended up being married to an undercover policeman. And what she told me was that her partner, while she was married to him, told her that John had been an undercover policeman who was infiltrating um, London Greenpeace that I was involved with. And also she told me that um, Bob Robinson, who I had known, who was involved with London Greenpeace in the 80s, uh, and who you may have seen in the papers last week, um, that he, uh, had actually been an undercover policeman whose, whose real name was Bob Lambert. So um, this, this was all kind of happening <coughs> around the same time as the Mark Kennedy stuff. And I, uh, what, what the police were trying to say about Mark Kennedy was this was just one rogue officer, you know, that he'd gone off the rails and it, it was nothing. They didn't want it, it well, they'd never wanted this to happen. Um, and through what had become apparent through what this woman had told me, it was, it was obvious that actually this was quite, this was much more widespread than just one rogue officer. Um, and I got together with other women who um, basically had been in a similar situation and we decided to bring uh, a legal case against the Metropolitan Police to try and prevent this from happening to anybody else again. Uh, there are eight of us involved in the particular case that I'm involved <coughs> with. Um, we had, between us, we had relationships with five undercover policemen over a period spanning uh, over 20 years. Um, so it's absolutely apparent that this was a, a, a systematic thing going on. It wasn't just like, you know, rogue officers as they're trying to portray it. Some of the things that we've encountered since we've started bringing this case, initially people sort of, some, some of the responses were that, well, this is not, this is not anything much, you know, it's, it's not much difference to... Uh, you know, a man lying about his age or his, his job, that's the kind of thing that happens all the time. Um, but actually, and then, you know, we should just get over it. But actually, there is a, a really vast 
difference um, because what we're talking about here is, is identities that were created by the state for the purposes of spying on people. And it's not just like one aspect of their personality that, that they're lying about. This is an entirely false persona. You know, they've got false name, false date of birth, false political interests, false marriage status, because most of them are married, false job. Um, there's, there's virtually nothing about, well, there is nothing about them that's real. Um, and, and then, to cap it all, they're there to spy on you and your friends and to undermine movements for change. So, it, you know, it really is a very real violation that people should be very concerned about and, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be... It should, we really don't want this to happen to anybody else again, which is why we're fighting this case. Um, and also, on top of that, it's not just the eight of us that are fighting the case that I'm involved with. There are other, there are other women and some men that are uh, bringing a case over um, the effects of these undercover relationships. So one of the cases is, is, is actually Bob Lambert, who um, you may have seen in the paper last year, sorry, last week, <laughs> actually had a child that he fathered while he was undercover and left the woman who was a, an animal rights activist to bring up that child on her own, um, you know, and she didn't find out the truth until her son was 20, their son was 26 years old, which is absolutely shocking that the police can do that. What for us this highlights is actually it's a very sexist mindset that basically says that it's acceptable for police, police officers to abuse women in this way and derail our lives in order to shore up the fake identity of undercover policemen and under, undermine political movements. Um, there's nothing in law that says that if a police officer is, suspects you of involvement in, uh, in a crime, let alone involvement in political movements, that they're entitled <laughs> to sleep with you in order to find out. Um, you know, and that's for a very good reason, because it would be wide open to abuse. Any police officer could use that as an excuse to basically have sex with people unknowingly. Um, if the police want to search your house, they have to apply for, to the courts for a search warrant, and there is supposed to be some scrutiny of what you're, uh, you know, what you're supposed to have done. But with the undercover policemen, they actually moved into people's houses for as long as five years. Um, and during that time, they had free access to people's belongings. They had free access to people's minds. Um, you know, they, have, they basically have access to your innermost thoughts without any form of protection. So, you know, for us, we're left with not knowing um, how much of our personal lives and thoughts are now stuck in special branch files, which is a really kind of violating feeling. Um, and, yeah, that was one other thing I wanted to touch on, that most of the commentary about, about these, these cases has actually been about the sexual side of it, but for most of us, it's actually the intimacy of the relationships that is most harmful in terms of destroying your ability to trust other people in the future. So since our case start, started, and with the statements made by Peter Francis, the whistleblower, who was the, an ex-undercover policeman in the Special de Demonstration Squad, people have actually been really shocked by the extent of the police intrusion into people's lives, uh, with revelations about spying on family campaigns for justice, including the family of the murdered teenager Stephen Lawrence, and uh, the Ricky Real family, and other families, um, and as... Dave has talked about the evidence of police assisting with the blacklisting of trade unionists and, and other political campaigners. Um, we also know there's been a, a, a two-way flow of information between the police and um, corporations. For example, with the McLibel case, we actually sued the police uh, for giving information to the private investigators that were um, infiltrating London Greenpeace. Uh, when we brought that case, the police did not actually... Um, they, they, by law, they're supposed to make disclosure ab about relevant issues, and they didn't disclose the fact that Bob Lambert, for example, had been involved in writing the leaflet that we were sued over. They didn't disclose the fact that John, my ex-partner, had been involved in distributing the leaflets and running campaigns. They kept all of that secret. So there is a cover-up going on, and you know that's why we're, we're carrying on fighting with this case to make sure that they can't cover it all up. It's important that everyone's aware of the efforts by the state and powerful in institutions to undermine movements for social progress um, so that we can all learn how to resist uh, the efforts that they're making. But it's also very important not to let our fear and suspicion of other people uh, undermine our own efforts too. Um, 
and what we should do is, is you know, try and be as open as possible and trust each other as much as possible and also take heart from the facts in a way that they are infiltrating our campaigns because actually it shows that they know that our campaigns and our uh, struggle for freedom and justice does actually have an effect and it does change people's minds. So basically carry on fighting for justice and, and don't let them get you down. Yeah.